Hi, good afternoon. And uh, let me start the plenary session three. I'm Professor Heshimba from South Korea. And uh, my co-chair is uh, Professor Kim Park Luing from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you very much for joining in this nice symposium. So we have uh, four renowned speakers in the regarding precision medicine and the biomarkers in s -mindology. And uh, it is a great honor for me to introduce the first speaker, Professor Walter Canonica from Italy. And uh, he will talk about precision medicine in asthma. And Walter is a uh, lot of publication and the leading lots of work in asthma and the precision medicine and the allergen immunotherapy. And also today, he will talk about the, the very interesting result regarding precise medicine in asthma. Please, Professor Walter Canonica. Thank you very much, uh, Haisim. It's uh, a pleasure uh, being even today uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, uh, precision medicine uh, in, uh, in asthma. Well, uh, first of all, uh, my disclosure of uh, interests. And uh, let me start. Uh, a few years ago, three years ago, actually, uh, we tried to analyze what was uh, the personalized and uh, how uh, the steps forward to best treatment from uh, the current disease management uh, to the best uh, treatment uh, for our patients. While this, uh, and uh, I will mention uh, some of these points, of course, uh, precision and personalized medicine, and also something about uh, the omic uh, sciences. I will go through GINA, endotypes, biomarkers, and the biologics. Well, let me start with GINA. Well, I have to say that the GINA, they, they played a crucial role uh, uh, something like 30 years ago. Why? Because they finally uh, highlight uh, the importance of inhaled corticosteroids. And, uh, and in fact, with my uh, friends uh, in Argentina, uh, namely Carlos Baena Cagnani, we demonstrated that how GINA increased uh, the use of inhaled corticosteroids and on the other side, decreasing uh, the mortality for uh, asthma in that country. And uh, in uh, 2016, Gina, of course, introduced uh, uh, all the new biologics in the step five uh, of uh, asthma. And uh, this uh, was uh, also uh, leading the same year. Alvar Agusti uh, actually proposed the, the idea of treatable traits as uh, the approach uh, to precision medicine. Why? Because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the Oslerian paradigm that was uh, mainly based uh, on uh, the apparatus, uh, in a way or in another, uh, was uh, blocking uh, what was the, uh, the way forward. Why? Because uh, actually was uh, mainly approaching a sort of one-size-fits-all approach, and that time was the way to go. And uh, let's say that in uh, 2015, there was this paper uh, in the New England. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, look at here, what is precision medicine? Well, the term precision, personalized, and individualized medicine are uh, often used interchangeably. Well, this is not the case. Why? Because precision medicine is focused on the endotype, not and I mean on the mechanism of uh, the patient's disease. In that I mean that first you have to identify the mechanism, then you have uh, to develop the diagnostic tool, able to identify the mechanism, and uh, then to uh, develop a treatment that is able to block specifically the mechanism. Well, uh, I have to say that something like 10 years ago, there was this uh, uh, provocative paper where uh, the idea of uh, precision medicine uh, was uh, proposing a new classification uh, of uh, diseases just based on their mechanism. 
which actually, clinically speaking, is, is difficult. That's the reason why I love the title of uh, this paper that is not related to asthma, but we should always use uh, a grain of salt uh, when uh, we are evaluating the new approaches. Well, nonetheless, uh, I mean, uh, I have to give you an idea how precision medicine uh, is, uh, is the future. Why? Because still, uh, 2026, the investment uh, in uh, precision medicine uh, is, uh, is going to be very, very important. And uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to give a talk on allergen immunotherapy. Uh, why? Because we described allergen immunotherapy as a prototype of uh, precision medicine, because it is responding exactly to the characteristics I described be before as a precision uh, therapy. And uh, we have to say that uh, it was there, but uh, we didn't think about it. Nonetheless, uh, we are now considering, and uh, this is, was a very recently paper published uh, with a lot of uh, friends, uh, as uh, still a unique and unmatched model of uh, personalized medicine. Why? Because uh, precision medicine is uh, a prototype. Uh, allergen immunotherapy is a prototype. Yeah. And then it's in the context of personalized medicine. Why this is empowering the allergist role? Why? Because we have, uh, for instance, uh, different routes of the administration of uh, allergen immunotherapy with uh, different uh, proposal in terms of uh, products uh personalization of the dosage uh, and so to make uh, uh the final aim that was uh, i already described the best for our patients and this is because we can personalize in other words uh, to focus on patients and persons and let me say that uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, omics uh, we have to consider also humanomics and personal the first step when we are talking about asthma is to choose the right device to personalize the treatment. And in Italy, for instance, we have 58 different devices on the market. So you have to choose the one that is best for the patient that you have in front of you. Keeping in mind that if the patient has to learn by himself how to use it, well, 80% will not be able to use it properly, probably reaching 50%. I mean, uh, if uh, you are training them how to use. Well, to make a long story short, our, uh, our task uh, is to put together all the possibility we have to investigate and to find out what is the personalized treatment for our patients. And for instance, as far as uh, uh, treating uh, uh, asthma, with uh, three different therapies. One that is uh, simplifying uh, is the use uh, of the triple therapy that is nowadays in, uh, in, uh, in the step five, uh, very well considered and demonstrated. Now let's go how to, what are the strategy for integrating uh, uh, personalized medicine? One of the major is sharing the decision with the patient. And of course, this is a, a crucial step in this sense. Another very important uh, is, uh, is the point of the P4 medicine. That I mean predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory that I already touched uh, before. Another uh, point for personalization is uh, the definition of the phenotype. The sole events started 10 years ago to describe how, how to differentiate the different, uh, the different uh, phenotypes. Well, let's say that uh, nowadays we can consider that we have allergic asthma, eosinophilic, uh, non-allergic asthma, and uh, let's say pausigranulocytic or neutrophilic asthma. We will come back on, uh, on this, which actually is also the case uh, when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, chronic rhinus sinusitis with the nasal polyps, uh, as we published uh, a few years ago, and uh, the uh, polyp uh, phenotypes, which is very reminiscent 
of what I was describing uh, for uh, asthma. On the other side, the Chris Breitling proposed that uh, allergic and non-allergic eosinophilic COPD is uh, the case. And uh, I mean, uh, describing that uh, allergen uh, uh, can be uh, in a certain way in some patients, uh, also a point uh, of induction, but also target in a COPD patient. I already mentioned uh, some of uh, the omic uh, sciences that uh, are nowadays important, but uh, Johanna Gacha described uh, how the phenotypes and the endotypes, uh, and uh, uh, I had a chance uh, to chair this uh, uh, issue of the seminars uh, in uh, immunology. And I seen that uh, she considered how important are the validated and qualified uh, biomarkers uh, in describing uh, phenotypes and uh, endotypes. And uh, being this the case, uh, let me talk briefly about uh, the biomarkers. So Nick and Anya, in, uh, this, uh, in the same issue of uh, the seminars, uh, I mean, he described all the potential new biomarkers, venous, pheno, the blood uh, biomarkers, in that I mean IgE eosinophils, the exhaled the condensate, the sputum uh, uh, evaluation, of course, the tissue biopsy and the bronchoviolar lavage, or the urine uh, metabolite. Let me let me uh, uh, tell you, he described what are the advantages and the limitations uh, of uh, all these uh, biomarkers. And uh, we published uh, what is in perspective, very important in a real uh, world uh, about uh, severe asthma. And uh, once again, we described, uh, we evaluated the uh, periostin, uh, blood eosinophil, serum IgE, and phenol. And uh, actually, we didn't find that the serum uh, periostin was a reliable one. Nonetheless, uh, the eyes are the International Severe Asthma Registry. I mean, uh, we made uh, a cluster analysis using the different uh, biomarkers. I, I understand it, that that is uh, quite complicated, but uh, I mean, uh, just to show you that uh, there is uh, an overlapping between these uh, uh, three major uh, biomarkers, uh, and uh, we evaluated the possibility to differentiate in five different uh, clusters. The five different clusters that you can see here, uh, look at, for instance, cluster five, that is uh, not so much represented. Younger males, uh, low BMI, low EFB1, and the presence of nasal polyps, uh, described in this cancer with uh, low pheno, not uh, so ma uh, much uh, uh, Ig level and uh, a lot of eosinophils. Well, then, if you are looking at the distribution of uh, these uh, clusters, for instance, by age, or the presence of nasal polyps, uh, you can see that you can describe uh, having an idea in, uh, in, uh, in the clinical setting uh, or how important they are. And this is uh, really uh, providing a pathogenetic inside uh, that could be really relevant uh, to personalized uh, medicine. And, uh, and uh, we are aware, of course, that the, the biologics, they were very, very important. And Chesme, uh, looking at uh, Chesme Actis, uh, looking at uh, the mechanism, uh, uh, the immunological mechanism of asthma, uh, I, I, I described with this group uh, how complex uh, is uh, and how all these uh, cytokines, uh, for instance, uh, can be a uh, target uh, of uh, treatment as described uh, in, uh, in this uh, other one, uh, where uh, on the bottom, uh, you can see the different uh, uh, phenotypes uh, of, uh, of uh, severe asthma. Now, how to choose the biology? Well, let's say that uh, I can't agree more that uh, we should uh, rely on severe asthma centers. Why? Because in most of the case, the big problem is that uh, there is uh, no adherence to treatment with inhaled treatment. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is a very important point. On the other side, 
Jeff Dreesen, uh, I mean, uh, he touched base on how should we decide uh, the treatment. And uh, he said that we don't have a head to head uh, uh, approach. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a pity. Why? Because uh, our patient, they need uh, a better approach compared to the one that uh, we have nowadays. And uh, Joanna Gace described uh, clearly how to go to the different uh, treatment. But please be aware that uh, the so-called indirect comparison are not reliable. And in fact, uh, I mean, uh, she underlined uh, how one of them show that bepolizumab is significantly better than the other ones. Another one uh, that uh, is claiming that resolizumab is uh, superior to other biologics. And the third one is uh, that benralizumab is uh, better than uh, mepolizumab. So uh, I see that methodologically speaking, we need uh, much better uh, studies, or if the case, uh, also uh, had to have a study. As in this uh, uh, guideline uh, recommendation, we need a head to head uh, study. And of course, we need also prospective uh, trials. Uh, I love this paper by Johanna because uh, they are describing uh, a new concept that is the teratype. Teratype uh, is, of course, uh, the best uh, eligibility of the patient uh, having some uh, features. And uh, I think that the real world evidence uh, will help a lot personalized medicine. Why? Because if we are talking about uh, the selection of the patients in asthma, for instance, I mean, uh, in a randomized controlled trials, to make a long story short, uh, you are selecting the patients, uh, for instance, uh, if uh, is uh, a smoker, if he has uh, comorbidities, to make a long story short. Actually, in the randomized controlled trial, I mean, we are in only uh, 1% or a little bit more of the real patients. Let me give you an idea. For instance, uh, women uh, are not very well represented in, uh, in uh, most of the trial. Uh, but this paper is, is quite old. But very recently, it was analyzed that the ones having a, a high BMI are not enrolled even in the biologic uh, uh, randomized control trials. And uh, in addition, if you are looking at the race in terms of Afri Afro-Americans, for instance, uh, well, the number of uh, uh, of Afro-Americans uh, is not very well represented in the trial. And uh, also the smoking status is not uh, considered proper. So in uh, reality, we have to talk about uh, efficacy, randomized control trial yeah, in a very selected population and effectiveness in the general population that is exactly the target of the real world uh, evidence uh, evaluation. Let me give you an example. Adherence is a bias because in the randomized control trial, you have high adherence, uh, which is not the case in clinical practice. That's the reason why we published uh, a manifesto concerning real life research. And uh, one of the major concepts is uh, that in real world evidence, uh, the prospective registries uh, uh, are providing high quality data. And this uh, can also be accepted by regulatory authorities. And we have to interact. So actually the networking uh, should be severe asthma centers uh, and then the national uh, uh, network as we did in Italy, for instance, with the severe asthma network Italy. Then, of course, uh, we need to integrate, as ERS uh, proposed uh, for SHARP, that is working quite well. And then also ISAR, the International Severe Asthma Registries. And then, as I showed before, it's possible to get very impacting uh, data. And from big data, we have to go really to precision medicine. How? Because uh, 
such an interaction is uh, unavoidable. So we have to create uh, this uh, network uh, to have more data. And let me tell you what, uh, give you an example. About uh, severe asthma, I have to say that I, I was impressed because with the, our network, we demonstrated that 42% of our patients, they have nasal polyposis and 25, they have bronchiectasis. So, I mean, today, the severe asthma diagnosis is changed compared to the one of a uh, uh, few years ago. Now, from current disease to the best treatment, uh, yeah, precision personalized medicine, real life and big data will provide us uh, uh, the way to have uh, an improved uh, diagnosis. And then we have to follow also what the, the patients are requesting. The patients are uh, requesting uh, in the patient charter. I wish just to mention that, uh, I mean, uh, they deserve not to be reliant on oral corticosteroids and they deserve uh, to have uh, uh, a, a great access to the best uh, treatment as, as possible. Let me go to the take home messages. Biologic represents definitely a step forward uh, in precision medicine. Uh, we do need yet uh, uh, the biomarkers uh, to, to define the responders to biologics. And so we need uh, further research in this uh, sense uh, to define the responders and super responders to biology. While I think that the big data, real world data will help us in this uh, sense, uh, but I wish to uh, conclude uh, with uh, with uh, this uh, sentence in the paper that was published a few years ago about personomics. We should train today our students and our residents uh, in, uh, in the definition and in the use of personalized medicine. With this, I thank you very, very much for your attention and of course all my group and uh, if the case, you have my mail. Thank you. Thank you very much for nice talk and Walter. And uh, yes, in the chat, there is a no question or a comment. So I have a one question for you. So, and uh, yes, we need a lot of the, uh, we need a very good biomarkers for the diagnosis and the selection of biologics or uh, monitoring of the, any clinical parameters during the treatment. So we have uh, actually type two biologics and they can apply in the clinical practice for CV asthma. So can you suggest that uh, any potential non-type two biomarkers and uh, can be applicable in, in clinical practice? Can you suggest? Well, up to now, I think that we do not have yet uh, this kind of uh, approach. I believe that, for instance, uh, one of the approach for having biomarkers in the sense uh, could be the bronchoalveolar lavage of the induced sputum, which might uh, uh, address uh, uh, us uh, in this sense. Or, you know, the, the negativity Mm. of uh, of uh, the type 2 biomarkers, you know, up to now. Uh, I think uh, that uh, due to the absence of uh, biologics, uh, I mean, uh, the research in this sense uh, is, uh, is a little bit, uh, is a little bit late. But uh, you know that uh, now we have the chance to, 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 to use uh, possibly new biomarkers, maybe uh, also working on uh, this uh, part uh, of uh, our patients. So probably uh, I'm, I'm very positive in, uh, in the near future to have uh, possible approaches uh, for these patients too. Okay, thank you. We are expecting that uh, new bio biologics in, in patients with non-type 2 asthma. And also yeah. we may have a very useful biomarker as well for non-type non 2 asthmatic patients. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, now we, we move to second talk. And uh, Professor Lung, can you introduce yeah. the second speaker? Thank you, uh, Hey Sim. Uh, so the second speaker is Professor Kenji Ishikara. So just um, some background about uh, Professor Ishikara. So he got the MD uh, in 1984 and then PhD degree from the 
um, Yusuf University in Fukuoka in 1993. And he's um, uh, serving in uh, many uh, different um, professional bodies within Japan, including the, being the president of the Japanese Society of Pedagogy and also a member of the Science Council of Japan. And he's a recipient of Merit Prize from the International Immunology Congress and the Hokuriku um, Sayaku Research Award in Allergy from Japan Allergy Foundation and Scientific Award from the Japanese Society of Laboratory Medicine. So, um, uh, Professor Ishihara is going to speak to us on the up-to-date information of Perry Austin, a key mediator and a promising biomarker for allergic diseases. Professor Ishihara. Thank you, uh, Professor Loeng. So, first and, of all, uh, uh, Professor, I would like to uh, thank Professor uh, So, Louis please Powell start Powell. my slides. So, first of all, I would like to thank Professors uh, Ruby Pawanka oh, and Julia Wang to invite me and to give me opportunity to have a talk. So thank you for uh, Professor Loeng and the Professor. So my name is Kenji Izuhara. So the title of my today's talk is Up-to-Date Information on Periostin, a key so media start and my the promising biomarker for allergic diseases. So while I have been working on elucidating mm -hmm how allergy inflammation occurs and what molecule we can apply as a biomarker and we can target to treat allergic patient. So we found that periosin plays an important role in the pathogenesis of allergic diseases and it has a potential to be a biomarker, useful biomarker for treating allergic patient. So today I'm going to summarize the information of periosin in allergic diseases and talk about the up-to-date information of Periosin as a mediator and a biomarker for allergic diseases. So here I show you type 2 immune responses in allergy. So invasion of allergens uh, triggers allergy. So invasion of allergens activate RC2 via epithelial cytokines such as R25, R33, and TSLP and activate uh, T82 cells via dendritic cells. Activated IL-C2 and uh, T82 cells secrete uh, signature type 2 cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. So these cytokines act on immune cells such as B cells and eugenophiles, and moreover, uh, non-immune cells such as epithelial cells, fibroblasts, and smooth muscle cells, eliciting uh, the typical features of allergic diseases. So thus, type 2 cytokines play a central role in the pathogenesis of allergic diseases, and several antagonists aiming at blocking these cytokines have been developed for treatment of allergic diseases. So I focused on R13 among many type 2 mediators and tried to elucidate how IL-13 contribute to generation of the phenotypes of allergy more than 20 years ago. So to elucidate how IL-13 generates asthma phenotypes, we try to comprehensively identify IL-13 inducible genes in airway epithelial cells. So for that purpose, we used DNA microarray. So of course, uh, we got a lot of genes upregulated by IL-13. So among those genes, so we focus on one molecule called uh, periostin. So however, when we acquired the data of DNA microarray, so nothing was known about the correlation between periostin and allergy. So then we started to examine how periostin is involved in allergy. So I explain you what kind of molecule periostin is. So I always say that periostin has two phases. So these are extracellular matrix protein and matricellular protein. So collagen, fibronectin, and tennessin C are well-known extracellular matrix proteins. So periosin bind to, uh, uh, so the periosin belongs to these proteins. So uh, the physiological roles of these proteins are maintenance of tissue or organ structure. 
And moreover, the pathological loads of these proteins are generating fibrosis as a result of inflammation. So perioxin plays such a role by binding to other extracellular matrix proteins. So another phase of perioxin is a matricellular protein. A part of extracellular matrix protein uh, binds to the receptors on cell surface like cytokines and transduce the signals in, in the cells. So these proteins are called matricellular proteins, and perioxin belongs to matricellular proteins. So we find that the actions of perioxin as a matricellular protein is important for the pathogenesis of allergic inflammation. So we examined whether perioxin is expressed in inflamed sites of allergic diseases. So perioxin is observed in brown here. So you can see that uh, so the perioxin is highly expressed in sub-epithelial areas of the inflamed sites in asthma, atopic dermatitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, and allergic conjunctivitis. So since perioxin is a dancery molecule of alpha and alpha 13 and it is known that uh, alpha and alpha 13 are highly expressed in all these inflamed sites, so it is no wonder that perioxin is highly expressed in the patient with these diseases. So these results indicate that perioxin is involved in the process of allergic reactions. So we have already revealed that epithelial mesenchymal interaction via perioxin is important uh, for allergic inflammation. So in the left panel, uh, so the perioxin produced in fibroblast by stimulation of IL-4 or IL-13 act on keratinocyte. Upon stimulation of perioxin, keratinocyte produce TSLP or IL-24. So then TSLP accelerates uh, type 2 inflammation via dendritic cells. And IL-24 causes uh, barrier dysfunction respectively. So in the right panel, uh, so the perioxin derived fr from fibroblast act on fibroblasts themselves together with IL-1-alpha derived from keratinocyte. So this causes induction of inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6 in fibroblast. So thus perioxin plays an important role for the onset or the acceleration of allergic inflammation. So perioxin has a characteristic that it easily moves uh, from the inflamed regions into blood. So therefore, we can apply serum perioxin to biomarkers in many diseases as listed here. So moreover, uh, so the perioxin has a characteristic that it easily moves not only into blood, but also into other body fluids. So for example, so the perioxin can be detected in sputum or exhaled breast condensate. So it can be applied to a biomarker for asthma. So another example is that perioxin can be detected in tears of allergic conjunctivitis patient. So if we use these samples to apply perioxin to a biomarker for allergic diseases, so it has the advantage that perioxin in these samples reflect directly local inflammation. So from here, so the, I'll talk about the uh, up-to-date information of perioxin. So we recently established the new mouse model of atopic dermatitis called phase mouse. So phase mouse means uh, facial atopic dermatitis with scratching mice. So in these mice, uh, so the phase mouse, uh, so uh, IKK2, a signaling molecule in the canonical pathway of the nf kappa b signals is locked under the control of nesting promoter. And as a result, so the IKK is depicted in facial dermal fibroblast, but not in body fibro, uh, fibroblast. So because uh, the developmental origins of facial and body dermal fibroblast are different. 
So, so then, so these mice elicit skin inflammation limited in faces and severe uh, scratching due to itching. So here I show you the histological findings of phase mass. So the phase mass shows increases in keratinocyte proliferation, eosinophil and mast cell numbers, like the features observed in skin of an atopic dermatitis patient. So as shown here, so the phase mass show upregulation of type 2 cytokines such as IL-4, IL-5, IL-9, IL-13, TSLP, and periostin, like skin of the atopic dermatitis patient. So you can see that periostin shown in red is highly expressed in the dermis of phase mass. Moreover, uh, so serum IgE and serum periostin is enhanced compared to control mass. So these features are very similar to atopic dermatitis patient. So taken together, we have concluded that phase mouse is a novel mouse model of atopic dermatitis. So to elucidate the pathological role of periostin in phase mouse, so we made it uh, phase mouse mice with periostin knockout mice. So surprisingly, uh, phase mice lacking periostin showed very decreased uh, scratching behaviors. So these results suggest that so the periostin is critical for itching of phase mass. So here I show you the movie of phase mass and phase mass lacking periostin. So the left one is normal phase mass and the right one is phase mass lacking periostin. So you can see that in the left panel, so the uh, normal phase mass show uh, uh, severe scratching behaviors using lower limbs. In contrast, uh, so in the right panel, uh, so the phase mass lacking uh, periostin does not show such uh, behaviors. So this is a very uh, striking uh, difference. Okay, so I summarize the findings of phase mouse lacking uh, periostin. So it has been recently revealed that many type 2 cytokines such as IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, IL-33, and TSLP directly act on sensory neurons eliciting itching. So in addition to these cytokines, periostin can also act on the, these neurons via its receptor integrity. So these results highlight a novel mechanism of itching in atopic dermatitis and show that periostin is a novel target for controlling itching in atopic dermatitis. So in the last section, I will talk about the aspect of periostin as a biomarker. So first, I will talk about serum periostin as a biomarker for atopic dermatitis. So this is a collaboration study with Professor Yamaguchi's group in Yokohama City's University. So the left, left panel shows that serum periostin level, levels are high in overall atopic dermatitis patient. So the right panel shows that correlation between serum periostin levels and clinical severities of atopic dermatitis patient. So serum periostin levels are higher according to the uh, clinical severities. So these results suggest that serum periostin has a potential to be a useful biomarker for treating atopic dermatitis. And moreover, considering the result of phase mass, so we assume that serum periostin may reflect 
the degree of itching. So we are now analyzing this point. So we next examine the correlation between serum pollution levels and clinical types of atopic dermatitis. So as shown here, so serum pollution is high in the erythroderma type, whereas it is low in the prurigo type. So this suggests that so the background of the pathogenesis is different among the clinical types of atopic dermatitis, and serum pollution would reflect it. So next I show you the result of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps with from here. So this is a collaboration study with Professor Fujieda's group in Fukui University. So right now, uh, clinical severity of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps is estimated by clinical symptoms and eugenophilia numbers in nasal polyps. So when we examine the expression of pollution in nasal polyps from the patient, so it is well correlated with the severity of this disease. And moreover, so we found that the serum pollution is also associated with the clinical severity in this disease. The more important point is that serum pollution is well correlated with the relapse rate after the surgery in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps patient. So as shown here, so the pollution high group showed the higher relapse rate than the pollution low group. So it is very important information uh, to treat this patient because relapse of nasal polyp after surgery is a big problem for the patient and uh, clinicians. So lastly, I show you the result of allergic conjunctivitis. So the most important point is that we used tear tears as samples so, uh, so there are several clinical types of allergic conjunctivitis, such as atopic keratoconjunctivitis, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, and seasonal allergic conjunctivitis. So I don't mention the details of these types today, but atopic keratoconjunctivitis and vernal keratoconjunctivitis are chronic types of allergic conjunctivitis. And these types uh, sometimes show serious comorbidities such as corneal ulcers and the formation of giant papilla. So we found that tear pollution is upregulated in the patient with all of atopic keratoconjunctivitis, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, and seasonal allergic conjunctivitis. So it's almost all or nothing. Moreover, so tear periostin is higher in the patient with high clinical severities and corneal, uh, corneal damage. So therefore, we can apply measurement of tear periostin to diagnosis of allergic conjunctivitis. So these are people that contribute to the, uh, to the study that I show you uh, today. So I would like to thank uh, many colleagues and the collaborators that contribute to the study. So thanks to them, so we could uh, clarify the significance of periosin as a mediator for allergic diseases and could establish usefulness of measurement of periosin in allergic diseases. So I'm happy if I have a chance to collaborate with you. So I would like to close my talk and please to receive your question. Thank you for your attention. So, oh, um, thank you, uh, Professor Ishihara, for the uh, enlightening talk about uh, Peru Austin. I think it, actually, I'm sure there are many questions, but we'll leave the time for questions at the end of this session. So, my co chair, Professor Park, will introduce the next speaker. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, let, let us introduce the third talk in this session. And uh, Professor Stephen Gelly from the US. And uh, he will talk about the, the good, good side of allergy, resistance to diverse phenoms in the Staphylococcus aureus. Professor Stephen Gelly, please.
Thank you very much. Yes, the title of my presentation is The Good Side of Allergy, Resistance to Diverse Venoms and Staph aureus. I'd like to cover some early events in our understanding of mast cells, allergy, and IgE. And I call this the mast cell IgE paradox. Uh, these cells were described by Paul Ehrlich in 1877. Anaphylaxis was described by Portier and Richet, allergy by Clemens von Perquet, and the process Kustner reaction was discovered to be due to IgE, and that's the work of the Ishizakas, Johansson, and Benich. Since 1966, IgE-associated allergic diseases have increased markedly, raising the question, what was evolution thinking when it came up with mast cells, anaphylaxis, and IgE. I'd like to first describe some of the properties of mast cells. These can vary according to the origin of the cell. Uh, it can be activated by products of pathogens, products of complement activation, FC receptor-mediated signals, notably IgE and antigen, and a variety of other agents can activate mast cells, neuropeptides, endogenous peptides, such as endothelin-1, venom components, and leukocyte products. When the cell is activated, it releases granule-associated mediators, including proteases, and it can release arachidonic acid metabolites, cytokines, and chemokines, and these can have a variety of effects that regulate in a positive or negative sense immune responses. We were particularly interested in the finding that venom components could activate mast cells. And in fact, mast cells can be activated directly by diverse venoms, including the rattlesnake venom and the honeybee venom. What are some interesting things to know about venomous reptiles? They co-evolved with prey predator animals for about 200 million years. Venoms contain many different types of toxins which can produce local and systemic pathology, and there are up to 100,000 to 200,000 deaths a year worldwide due to venoms. Many venom toxins can induce mast cell degranulation by direct and or indirect mechanisms, and this was thought to increase the local or systemic pathology related to envenomation. Snakes bite to feed. These are small animals that they can swallow or in defense, individual snake bites can deliver very variable amounts of venom, depending on the species of snake. So in 1991, Margie Prophet, in a very enlightening article, described the function of allergy as immunological defense against toxins. She didn't do any experiments, but she synthesized the literature very beautifully. This was uh, reprised recently by uh, Meshitov and his colleagues. And I'll describe this as diverse stimuli activating quote unquote allergic host defenses. So the stimuli can be helmets, venoms, irritants. The allergic host defenses can be mast cells, basophils, IgE receptor, and so forth. And the tissue and functional and behavioral responses that are elicited include barrier enhancement, removal, expulsion of the provoking agent, inactivation, killing, restriction, tissue protection and repair, and avoidance, for example, of irritants and venomous species. Uh, we studied this with respect to reactions of the host in defense against honeybee venom. The first authors were Thomas Marischal and Philip Starkel, and Martin Metz was a co-collaborating author. I'm going to show you one a slide of some data uh, showing that immune serum can increase resistance to bee venom unless it's treated to impair the IgE function. So the model is to take uh, a low dose of bee venom injected into donor C57 black six mice, and at day 21, bleed those animals to get bee venom serum. The control is 
uh, PBS injected mice, and that gives PBS serum. Recipients get 250 microliters per day of, uh, uh, sorry, microliters of day 21 serum. And those are injected into naive C57 black six mice. And they're then challenged with high dose B venom. Now the B venom serum can be given untreated or treated with anti-IgE or by heating to inactivate IgE. So we found that with wild type we could passively transfer the B venom resistance to wild type mice or to IgE deficient mice, but not to mice lacking the high affinity uh, IgE receptor, either the alpha or the gamma chain, or to mice deficient in mast cells. I'm gonna show you now some experiments we did with normal mice. And prior um, to B venom challenge, they were passively immunized with a variety of agents. And I'm first gonna show you the results of the animals that were passively immunized with untreated B venom serum. And that produced a drop in temperature by six hours on the left when the animals were challenged with a high dose of B venom. On the right, um, you can see that these animals had a very low mortality rate. Uh, more than 80% of them survived seven days after injection of the high dose of B venom. When we compared this to PBS serum treated animals, we found that the temperature change was markedly more severe and the death rate was extremely high, about 80% uh, of the animals dying. And similar results were obtained when we removed um, the IgE from the B venom by heating it or giving anti-IgE. So this showed that the immune serum, specifically IgE, can increase resistance to B venom unless it's treated to impair IgE function. So these data were reported in a manuscript um, and the title of that manuscript was a beneficial role for immunoglobulin E in host defense against honeybee venom. The, uh, the article uh, had one study of Russell's Viper, which is shown on the cover. And we showed the Th2 responses induced by sublethal amounts of Russell's Viper venom can enhance resistance of mice to challenge with potentially lethal amounts of venom. And a, var a variety of experiments were then done to complete that study. And we showed that IgE antibodies, the high affinity IgE receptor and IgE mediated local anaphylaxis can limit snake venom toxicity. And this was in Jackie in 2016. So I'd like to summarize up until this point, first describing the role of mast cells and in innate responses. I didn't have time to show these data, but we showed that mast cells can contribute to the innate immune responses that diminish the morbidity and mortality induced in mice by a first exposure to many venoms of four different species of poisonous snakes, the Gila monster, two scorpions, and the honeybee. And mast cell derived proteases, either CPA3 or mast cell protease 4, that can degrade venom components represent important elements of such innate responses. Mast cells probably can't enhance resistance to all venoms. However, enhancing innate resistance to potentially toxic molecules may represent a phylogenetically ancient function of mast cells that actually may have been evident before the evolution of antibodies. So on the far left are control eggs of the invertebrate Staela plicata. The black dots are uh, test cells. Uh, and those test cells degranulate when stimulated with 4880. And these test cells had proteases, uh, heparin, and were probably mast cells in the tunicate. And uh, Rick Stevens and his group did additional work on this and considers them ancient mast cells. When we look at acquired immune responses, we find that IgE, high affinity IgE receptor, and mast cells contribute to these acquired Th2 responses 
that can reduce the morbidity and mortality induced by potentially lethal doses of honeybee or Russell's viper venom. We showed in vitro that mouse mast cells sensitized with anti-honeybee venom, IgE, can degranulate when exposed to 100-fold lower concentrations of bee venom than is needed to induce the degranulation by unite mechanisms. And in vivo, this would hasten and render more systemic the mast cell response to envenomation. The immune system probably needs to respond to only a limited number of venom-associated antigens in order to generate a protective IgE response to the whole venom. We showed that as few as one uh, antigens would be sufficient for the IgE to activate the cells. And then of course, all the proteases are released. And these findings, which mainly have been developed in C57 black six mice, strongly support Margie Prophet's hypothesis that elements of Th2 responses, namely IgE, the high affinity IgE receptor in mast cells, which also can participate in allergic disorders and immune responses to parasites can actually enhance host defense against venoms. Now, Phil Starkel had a very interesting idea, and that was that mast cells and IgE might also be involved in host defense against some uh, non-venomous agents, including Staph aureus an estimated 20 to 30% of humans are long-term carriers of Staph aureus and each year around 500,000 patients in United States hospitals contract a Staph infection and up to 50,000 deaths each year in the USA are linked to Staph aureus infections. So this paper was published last year and it showed that IgE effector mechanisms in concert with mast cells contribute to a quiet host defense against Staph aureus. So what Phil showed was that the immunity conferred in C57 black six mice by a primary skin infection with Staph aureus reduces the extent of pathology induced by a secondary ear skin and soft tissue infection with that bacteria. The decreased numbers of bacteria found in ear skin and lymph nodes during a secondary infection with Staph aureus requires the high affinity IgE receptor, IgE, and the alpha chain of the high affinity Ig receptor. I'm going to show you one figure from that paper. In the red, you see a mice that have received Staph aureus skin infection for seven days, and in the white, uh, mice that received PBS. Then in the green box at the top, uh, we induced pneumonia to Staph aureus, and we computed survival out to 72 hours. And the green box at the bottom, G, shows that the survival in the mice that had been exposed to Staph aureus through the skin was 80%, whereas the survival in the mice that had not been exposed to Staph aureus in the skin was uh, almost zero. We showed that IgE in the high affinity alpha chain of the high affinity IgE receptor are needed in B6 mice for reducing the lung bacteria and drop in body temperature during a secondary pulmonary infection with Staph aureus. And we show the skin infection with Staph aureus induces an acquired immune response, including Staph aureus specific IgE antibodies associated with a 70% reduced mortality upon secondary pulmonary infection with Staph aureus. Now, of course, this work was all done in mice. We thought about doing such experiments in humans, but that was not possible. But Martin Metz did experiments with human mast cell derived tryptase. He um, incubated these with 48 hour old uh, zebrafish embryos. And he showed that for three different ve venoms, the common lancehead, the red spitting cobra, and the Russell's viper, and the uh, tryptase treatment shown in the black uh, circles increased survival markedly compared to no treatment of the venom shown in the white circles. He found that at 10 micrograms per ml, uh, chymase and CPA in this species had no effect. He then tested the saw scaled viper venom, southern copperhead venom, and Western diamondback rattlesnake venom, he found in all cases 
triptase could improve survival to um, these zebrafish embryos treated with the venom. The embryos treated without triptase are shown in the white circles and they all died very quickly. Again, chymase and CPA was without effect uh, in this experimental system. So it raises the question, why do we have mast cells in IgE? And we is based mostly on in vivo studies and inbred mice. Mast cells and IgE have earned a bad name because for wheezing, they're partly to blame, but they all keep us all healthy despite pathogens stealthy. They're helping us win in the host defense game. Thank you very much for your attention and be careful out there. So we have some questions from um, on our chat. Uh, maybe I can start the, the first question is for, um, was that Ishihara? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we can select the one with, what's the prognostic value of periostin in severe asthma? Of oh, severe asthma, okay. Um, as I show you, uh, so the periostin has uh, two characteristics as a biomarker for uh, asthma. So one is uh, uh, periostin reflect uh, type two inflammation as a downstream molecule of R1 and R13. So it's almost the same as uh, uh, so the phenol or uh, eosinophil. So another characteristic of periostin is uh, it's a uh, uh, component of uh, fibrosis. So it means that uh, so it reflects uh, so the degree of fibrosis in asthma. So therefore, um, so it's uh, different from phenol. So therefore, uh, so the, um, in our uh, studies and also the some studies show that uh, so serum periosin is associated with uh, uh, poor lung functions in asthma patients. Uh, so uh, in, other, in other words, so periosin can predict uh, so the decline of lung functions uh, in uh, severe asthma patient. So this result is uh, very uh, uh, reproducible. So I think that is uh, uh, very uh, so the distinct uh, characteristic of periosin as a biomarker for asthma. So, um, so um, I mean that so, so that of course so the periosin is be, uh, involved in uh, so the uh, one of the uh, so the in, in uh, so the type two uh, biomarkers. Uh, so each type two biomarker has a different characteristic. We have to be uh, careful about it. And uh, another question from the floor, and we found that uh, you mentioned that the high periodontin level in atopic patient, atopic dermatitis patient. So. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, whether high serum periostin can predict the phenotype of atopic dermatitis as well? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, so, the, uh, so the many uh, studies show that uh, so, the, uh, so the serum periostin is high in atopic dermatitis, uh, uh, usually so the correlated with the severity of atopic uh, dermatitis. And uh, I think uh, so the next big question is that uh, so the uh, serum periostin can predict efficacy of uh, uh, biologics or uh, molecular target drugs for uh, atopic dermatitis. I think that is a very important question. And right now uh, in Japan, so we are now uh, conducting a, a study to see some uh, biomarker can predict uh, efficacy of dupirumab. And uh, uh, periostin is also uh, involved in, in the uh, list of biomarkers. And uh, uh, we have already uh, finished uh, so the entry and now uh, uh, analyzing uh, so the sample. So that uh, maybe so that we can see, uh, we can see the result uh, very soon. So, uh, uh, so we are very looking forward to it, yes. Uh, because that you mentioned that the periostin is related to itching sensation in atopic dermatitis. Uh -huh. So therefore that uh, if we treat with a uh, duplimab and mm -hmm. uh, you can predict that the reduction of a serum periostin in patient with uh, atopic dermatitis with improved the clinical symptom, particularly itching sensation. Do you agree? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, so the uh, so the uh, correlation between uh, itching and the pollution is very how do I say uh, challenging uh, uh, study right now. I mean, so the just uh, some uh, so basic uh, so that studies uh, show that result, but uh, nobody knows uh, so the uh, correlation between itching and serum pollution in atopic dermatitis patient, and of course uh, itching. Uh, can be uh, caused by various uh, mediators, not uh, 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 including not only uh, uh, so that not only by uh, so the pollution, but also other type two uh, uh, mediators such as IL thirty uh, three TSLP IL thirteen. So we don't know. Uh, uh, so the uh, I think so the uh, so the so. Itching, so, uh, so the correlation between itching and the serum pollution uh, is very uh, too too simplified. <laughs> so, but but of course we uh, I think uh, it's uh, we we think it's uh, uh, we should uh, analyze it. But uh, I mean, so that maybe uh, it's is very uh, tough, 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 tough study. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. And another question from Florida, they are very interested in that, that there are some study uh, published in the Jackie show that the high serum periostin may be useful marker for favorable responders to omalizumab treatment in severe allergic asthma. So do you think that uh, is there any, any update to the data relationship, uh, showing relationship between periostin level and omalizumab treatment responses? Um, so, uh, as you, rem you remember, uh, so the Professor Hanani uh, reported that uh, so some type 2 biomarkers, including periostin and phenol, are mm -hmm. correlated with the efficacy of uh, omalizumab. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also the, uh, my uh, collaborator, uh, Professor uh, Matsumoto in Kyoto University, also showed uh, show the same result. But uh, I think, uh, uh, to be honest, I think it's uh, very difficult uh, to predict the efficacy of uh, omarizumab just only by uh, one biomarker. So I think uh, we need to uh, combine yeah. so several biomarkers to, uh, if, uh, if we want to see the, uh, to predict the efficacy of some uh, biologics. Uh, yeah. So, including omarizumab. Yeah, it's not so easy. Yeah. Yeah, because that I have also one data that uh, after omarizumab treatment, that the serum periostin did not decrease after omarizumab treatment. Ah, ah, okay. Ah, you mean so that, ah, I don't uh, agree that uh, uh, mm -hmm. serum periostin is a good marker for predicting mm -hmm. the, the omarizumab treatment. Uh, yes. Uh, I think I remember that. Uh, so, the. Uh, uh, in the clinical trial uh, of uh, dupinumab, yeah, so yeah. the uh, after so the uh, dupinumab is administered, uh, so the uh, so the serum pollution is decreased. Yeah, so yeah, it may be the uh, yeah yeah um, uh, different between the uh, so the omarizumab and the uh, dupinumab. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think it's I have also a question to Professor Gelly that. Uh, you show me very interesting result that the IDE and the mast cell may have some protecting role to the, the, the uh, immune responses that the most data what did it driven uh, derived from the mouse model studies that uh, based on these knowledge how we can apply this knowledge in the, when we see the patient. Professor. Oh, that's, yes. That's, that's a challenging question. And uh, for example, uh, Professor Valent in Austria has some patients who've been treated for a type of uh, lymphoma who have experienced a virtual loss of tissue mast cells. And so far these patients appear to be okay but uh, then again, they haven't been challenged by any particular reptiles or mm. stinging insects. Mm. So I think that um, A, it's very difficult to do studies in humans mm -hmm. that would address that question. And B, um, over evolutionary time, 
uh, most of the human population has been in relatively warm uh, climates mm. where there's a lot of uh, poisonous animals. So I think that Prophet's idea that mast cells and IgE may be designed rapidly to decrease uh, toxicity of venoms is a very good idea, but it's one that's very difficult to test in humans. Oh, unfortunately. thank you very much. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've asked the members of my laboratory, none of them are willing to go into these experiments themselves. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Okay, uh, also one question from Professor Kelly. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, IgE effector mechanisms in mast cells uh, may be important for staph aureus. Uh, I would just wonder whether other staphylococcus, such as staph epidermidus and um, staphylococcus hominis, they are also um, regulated by these kind of mechanisms, and in particular relation to eczema. You know, different staphylococci are important in um, introphic eczema. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a very good question. And um, all of the data that we have are in that immunity paper, and that was focused entirely on Staph aureus. The, the experiments, as you can imagine, are very difficult to complete. Um, it'll be very interesting to look at other bacteria, for sure. Okay. Okay. So uh, there's uh, one last question, maybe for Professor Ishihara. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any fixed and validated serum level of serum periostin to consider uh -huh. it as waste or normal? Uh, actually, so the uh, so several uh, commercial uh, kit for periostin available, and uh, uh, so the cutoff level are different among uh, so the kit. So in our in the case of our kit. So the cutoff cut level is uh, 95 nanogram per ml, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, so the uh, so the cutoff levels are different uh, in other uh, kits. So the um, it's not uh, unified yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the uh, doctors are uh, Genji. They are interested in uh, whether you may develop the, the chip and uh, widely applicable Eliza <laughs> kit or not, because that the your kit is a still very expensive. I think uh, our kit is uh, cheap enough. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, uh, time's up for us to end this session. So I think you must agree with me that uh, the four speakers have given excellent lectures on, very enlightening lectures on uh, different from decision medicine. So I would like to thank um, Professor uh, Kalonika, Professor Ishihara, Professor Gelli, and Dr. Price for attending and for giving the um, uh, impressive lectures. And I also like to thank my co-chair, Professor Park, for uh, uh, keeping a very tight um, control about the time and also the questions. So with this, I would like to end this session. So we have a five minute break uh, before we start the um, sponsors and uh, satellite lectures. So thanks for joining. Hope you'll stay the rest of it. Enjoy the rest Thank of the day. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.